I was doing a book signing in Brisbane, and some and a young lady came up to the desk and was signing, lay on the desk, pulled her skirt all the way up to here, and asked me to sign her stomach. And every time I go to Australia, I tell this story on all the news media again, hoping that somebody will come and do it again, and <laughs> they never have. <laughs> Science fiction fans, comic book fans, fantasy fans, trekkers. Average folks dismiss them as losers and nerds. They dismiss average folks as mundanes. Fandom is a closed network open to anyone. Regardless of race, creed, or color, you'll be welcomed into this religion. Get nine friends and dress up as Jabba the Hutt, or sit in the corner and read a book. The universe is wide. Every weekend of the year, they gather in one city or another to dissect Doctor Who or boldly go where Star Trek went or just talk to comic book creators. 20,000 gathered at the San Diego Comic Convention, 6,000 at the World Science Fiction Convention, and just you and me and my computer Nancy here at Commander Con. Rising anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe. Here's a vote and the English only sign. Mm, 40,000 tons of Born with PCBs blew up the ozone layer today. Standing by for solid rocket booster separation. Greetings, prisoners of gravity. Welcome to Commander Con, the first science fiction and comic convention held in zero-G on a budget of zero-G. First of all, here's your list of events at the convention, and here's your name tag, and this is your directory to all of the Coke machines, and this is your tickets to the chocolate buffet. Now, the art room is drawing a crowd over there, and in the screening room, there's endless episodes of Outer Limits, Star Trek, and something called Four on the Floor. In our first panel, which is on the origins of fandom, it begins right about now. Welcome to the origins of science fiction fandom. Our keynote speaker is one of the most beloved and earliest SF fans, Julia Schwartz. Julie co-founded a science fiction fan magazine, I forget the name, but back in the 30s, it was one of the first fanzines. Thank you, Nance. Julie has since made a name for himself as an editor for DC Comics. Uh, Julie, it's Commander Rick. What can you tell us about the origins of SF fandom? Well, I guess the true origin is the letter pages in the back of Amazing Stories and Wonder Stories, two science fiction magazines that uh, were published in the 20s. Amazing came out in 26, and Wonder Stories about 29, I believe. And the uh, editor would like to receive letters from the readers, put it in the back of the magazine, and they would have discussions. So. Uh, Every once in a while, if I saw, or some fans saw, I was in New York, and if I saw that other fans lived in New York, we would correspond with each other and eventually get together. In my particular case, I came across a letter in a magazine about 1931 in Amazing Stories from Mort Mortimer Weisinger, who lived in the Bronx, uh, maybe about a mile away from me. And uh, he said the, there was a fan group called the Scienceers, and they meet, I can't recall, maybe every week, once every two weeks. Now, what Mort and I were especially interested in were the personalities behind the science fiction stories. For example, who was the writers? There was a writer named Dr. David, David H. Keller, M.D. He wrote stories that fascinated us, what we now call human interest stories. There was a, uh, a writer named Edmund Hamilton who had great battles in space. But we didn't know anything about them. Yeah, but who'd have thought you'd want to? I mean, after all, back then, science fiction was considered slightly more respectable than smut. How did you connect to these unknown authors? We wrote to the, we, we couldn't write to the uh, authors because uh, we didn't have their addresses. So we sent them to the magazine and asked to be forwarded to. Well, this is the first time any writers received fan mail personally. All the writers would read the letter departments too to see what Dr. Keller would read. Well, how did they like? my story, The Revolt of the Pedestrians, or whatever the story was. 
and they like to know. But that was the only contact they had. Now to get a letter from the reader was quite interesting, so they're very quick to respond. The first one to respond was Edward E. Smith, Doc Smith, who wrote the Skylark stories. And he told about himself and what he was working on. Edmund Hamilton came through, mainly Wade Wellman, and other writers. Since I became friendly and familiar with many of the professionals, I said to them, why don't you attend one of these meetings? They were glad to come because, as I explained earlier, the writers had no feedback except in the cold pit, but to meet somebody, that was great. So if they come to a meeting and we announce that so uh, Jack Williamson, for example, would be at the next meeting, twice as many people attended as before. I must backtrack since I went very fast over fandom, mm -hmm. that when fans met together in one city, sooner or later it was inevitable that you meet, want to meet the fans from another city. And the first time that happened was in 1936, when the fans in New York went down to Philadelphia to, to meet, and you can call that a convention or whatever you want. And that was 36, 37, the same thing happened in 1938. They all met in Newark. It was a success. In 1939, we held First World Science Fiction Convention. Forey, you've been a fan since the beginning. What's your most vivid memory of that first world con? When I went off in 1939 to the first world of science fiction convention, a rather big name for a, a small turnout. There were just 185 of us managed to get there, including a young Ray Bradbury. I lent him $50 to spend three and a half days and nights on a Greyhound bus, and he was busy getting autographs rather than, than giving them. Out of the 185 of us, uh, we had a banquet so expensive that only 29 could afford it. It was one dollar a plate. Yeah, they were still auctioning off the leftovers at the last convention I attended. How did you first discover science fiction? Well, in October 1926, little nine-year-old me was walking past a newsstand in a magazine called Amazing Stories, jumped off the stands, grabbed hold of me, take me home, little boy, you will love me. And I feel like I've just kind of grown with the, with the times. In the beginning, I was like a man in a desert dying of, of thirst and, and grateful for every little drop of, of water, every extra science fiction story that was published. In the beginning, there was just the one magazine, Amazing Stories. Three years later, uh, my mother was quite concerned. She took me aside and said, son, do you realize how many of these magazines you have? And I said, no, mother. She said, well, I've just counted them. You have 27. Now, can you imagine why the time you're a grown man, you might have a hundred? Well, <laughs> mother made it to 94, living in my 18-room home. And uh, according to the mayor of Los Angeles, who sent four librarians around one afternoon, then they picked their eyeballs up off the floor and poked them back in their sockets and went to work and told me I had 50,000 books. And I'm, Rick, I can just see your next question. You've got to say, Forey, have you read all of those books? Rick, I've read every last word in my collection. When I get a new book, I turn to the last page and read the last word. <laughs> Welcome, convention goers, to the panel on Breaking into Science Fiction. Science fiction has a long tradition of fans becoming writers. Names like Ray Bradbury, Isaac Asimov, Judith Merrill, um, uh, Frederick Pohl, and uh, yes, yes, thank you, Nancy. <clears throat> All those writers started out writing their own fanzines and then tried their hand at fiction. That may explain why SF has such active fans. The attitude is, hey kids, do try this at home. A lot of today's top writers graduated from fandom. Mike Resnick, Bruce Sterling, and Lois McMaster-Bujold. 